So imagine it's Friday morning and it's your birthday. So you wake up a few minutes before the alarm clock, you put on your favorite sweater, look in the mirror. You can see already the wisdom of this extra year reflected in your eyes. You really want to go to school, meet your friends, it's gonna be a good day. And then you see on the kitchen table the box. It's a present. You rush to it, you're tearing apart the, the wrapping paper, you open the box and there it is. The first present of your birthday, a big, beautiful piece of poo. Now, that's a nice story with a happy ending, isn't it? Right? Exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe not so much. Uh, see, in our society, we don't really are used to see poo as a present. It's actually dirt, right? It's something we do behind closed doors. We don't talk about it. We flush it away and we want it quickly out of sight and out of mind. In my village in Greece, we say that there is one place that even the queen goes alone. The toilet. The toilet. Yes. And still I will argue that there in the toilet, behind closed doors, what the, pr the queen produces is actually solid evidence that we are not alone, but that we are all interconnected in the big web of life. See, to me, this is ultimately what being human is about, connection to one another, to our places, to the ecosystems that our society is embedded in, to the whole earth, to the universe. And I will argue that nothing shows better this interconnectedness than poo. First of all, because we all poo, right? Uh, poo making is an egalitarian process. Humans do, cats and dogs do, cows, wolves, hares, elephants, whales, birds, insects. We all poo. What about plants? Do you think plants poo? Not per se, not per se, but they do have their own ways of eliminating substances and parts that they don't need anymore. The most beautiful poo of all, autumn leaves. So through poo, we get rid of these things that we don't need in our body anymore. Excess nutrients included. Now, nutrients are necessary for all living organisms, right? Plants take them from the soil, they pass them on to the animals, and then we humans and animals take them from them. Now, we also need nutrients, but not so much of it, and only or mainly when we grow up. So most of it, it leaves our body with poo, it returns to the soil, and the cycle starts again. No nutrients, no plants, no food, no life. So it is not uh, a surprise that there are so many extraordinary ways in nature to ensure that the nutrients keep cycling and the web of life keep going on. Take goats, for example. The, were you ever on holidays and, you know, you leave your car under a tree so that it doesn't heat up and then you come back and you find a goat sitting on it? Anyone? Is it only a Greek phenomenon? Could be. So anyway, what the, the goats are doing right there is that unlike sheep, that they are grazing close to the earth, they are eating the wood parts of, of shrubs and trees up there. And what they do when they defecate is that they are actually transporting the nutrients up from the treetops down to the soil. The same do giraffes, and without even needing to climb on a, t on a car. Or uh, take trees, for example. Some trees are producing these, these big, nice, sweet fruits. And the only reason they do it is to ensure their daily dose of poo. See, these fruits are mainly water and carbohydrates, so they are not very energetically intensive for the trees to make. But when the birds are coming, or the fruit bats, and they are sitting on the branch, and they are eating these fruits, you know, with the juices running on their chins, then their droppings go directly on the tree root and they are fertilizing it. But the champions of nutrient cycling are whales. See, most, um, most mammals or most animals in the sea, they are eating on the surface and they are 
pooing uh, down in the bottom, but the whales are doing the opposite. They go deep down in the ocean in depths that other animals cannot reach and they eat. And then when they come up to the surface to take a breath, and before they dive back in, they take a huge dump. And so they are spreading all the nutrients like nitrogen and iron on the surface. And then it's available for all the other species that are living in the surface, like the, the, the fish. And then the birds, they eat these fish and they fly inland and they carry these nutrients back to the land. So the whales are basically, let's say, the means or the reasons that nutrients that are buried down in the sea, they can transfer back to the land. So nutrients in the cycle of poo is, um, is what keeps the, the web of life moving, is this invisible thread that connects the one species to the other and then the other, and the glue that keeps us all connected to the ecosystem. But do you think that nutrients and, and uh, fertilizing is the only use of poo? Who said no? Good. Um, okay, so let's see some of the other stuff. You see, um, the hippos, for example, they don't see very well. So on their way to the lake, they are leaving their droppings behind so that then they can find them and trace their way back. Some carnivores, uh, they are eating the scuds of the herbivores to disguise their own smell when they are hunting. And some other times, they are, um, they are leaving secretions on their feces that can communicate information like location and species and geographical movements to other individuals. It's like uh, sending your WhatsApp location to your friends, but for wolves. And then there's dung beetles. So what these creatures do is that they are laying their eggs on the dung and then they make these balls bigger than themselves. And then they roll these balls and either bury them on the ground or leave them there and wait. So these balls, they are protecting their eggs. And once the eggs hatch, then they are nourishing the baby dung beetles. And it must be pretty good food uh, because these creatures are quite extraordinary. Not only they can roll these balls, but sometimes they weigh more than a thousand times their own weight. But they are also super clever. They can navigate in, in the dark by looking in the sky and, and taking signals like polarized light and color gradient and find the their way in the dark. So let's uh, leave all this magic happening there in the animal world for a while and let's come back to us. So the queen now is done with her job, okay? She has flushed her toilet, put her smartphone back in her purse, it's done. What happens to the poo? Yeah, see, um, we humans, we have a complicated relationship with what comes out of our body. Once we started living too many of us too close to each other, Poo became from a force of good, a fertilizer, a source of, of problem, uh, of, of disease, or even death. Have you, ever, have you ever heard of, of the great stink of London? Ah, you have, cool. Uh, well, I hadn't un until I was at the university, so maybe I will skip the story and I will just say that back there in, in London, when too many people were living too close to each other and uh, they had no infrastructure, no, no sewers, nothing to do with their excrements, they were just throwing them in Thames, right? The same river that then they used to draw drinking water from. So then disease came and, and cholera and back then they didn't know about bacteria and microorganisms and the germs theory and the fecal oral route uh, that the cholera was transmitted. They thought that what makes people sick is bad air, you know, like foul smelling gases. So actually what led eventually to, to, the, to the design and the implementation of a sewer network was the great stink when it was so hot and uh, you don't help me, you said you know, when it was so hot and everything started rotting in Thames and this, this blanket of stents just sat on top of London, right? And no one could even walk on the streets or stand by the window, let alone 
the politicians with the noble noses that had just moved in in their new premises just on the bank of the Thames River. And that was the beginning of the Assures. An unprecedented achievement for public health saved us from cholera, from waterborne diseases. At the same time, it's also a curse. See, what basically is happening in Sewers is that they mix uh, our, our feces, these packages of nutrients, with big amounts of clean drinking water. So these things separately each are a resource, but once we mix them together, we create huge amounts of waste water. And then we need to clean this water in order to be able to return it in the rivers and the sea and the solid residue that has the impurities, but also all the nutrients in there. We incinerate it, we landfill it, basically we lose the nutrients forever. And this, in this case, who is very telling of another aspect of human nature, I think. Being ingenious and inventive and a problem solver on the one hand, but a bit short-sighted and selfish on the other. <coughs> well, we start uh, doing things differently. There are compost toilets, that they are um, creating compost out of our poor item place. There are source separation toilets that keep uh, most of the water with the nutrients separate, so it's easier to recover. So we are doing things better. There is a brilliant book that um, I used a lot as an inspiration for, for, for my talk today. And there the writer says at some point that poo is, or poo making, is a process of gift giving with the earth. When we eat, we are receiving the gifts of the earth. When we poo, we are giving these gifts back. So it is this quality of poo making as gift giving that I think we humans uh, should restore. Maybe not giving poo as birthday presents, that was a joke, but not forgetting that receiving and giving back is how the web of life is woven. Not forgetting that poo is this invisible thread that connects one species to the other, us with the other, with the ecosystem, with Earth and with the universe. And then maybe we'll stop to treat shit like shit. Thank you very much.